Orkia in the Greek tongue means home, house. You know, many of you look forward every year to making a great vacation. Wow, just can't hardly wait to get on the road again. Get out there and just have a blast. You know, it's so enjoyable. But there's nothing like getting back home. Taking a deep breath to find the peace that you have there. There's just no place like home. That's where you have peace of mind. That's where you find your peace of mind. That's where you can relax. That's where you know this is your casa, this is your home. And certainly you enjoy that. That's why I believe that Jesus Christ utilized that home whereby you can experience those emotions of quiet, peace, hey, it's your home. You're it there. I mean, you, you know you're safe and so forth. So he likened that unto your body, which many times he related to as your house. This earthly tabernacle that we utilize for a short period of time as we walk this earth. But always remember, Paul made it very clear, you have two bodies. And anytime you think you only have one body, you've got blinders on and you can't see very far because you've got two. If you want a scripture reference, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses about 32 through the end of the chapter give you documentation that you have a spiritual body and a flesh body. Of course, we know that the flesh bodies return to dust. We're through with them. But the spiritual body, the inner man, resurrects instantly to the Father. For we do not serve a God of the dead, but a God of the living. So I want you, if you would, to open your Bibles to St. John chapter 14, which you're all familiar with. It's speaks of that chapter which Christ promised he was going to be leaving soon. That is to say he was going back to claim the throne, but that he would send the Holy Spirit, which is to say the Comforter. But I want to pick up on the subject we've covered before, mansion. But I, I want to talk about the Lord's house a little bit this time. We ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. St. John chapter 14, verse 1, and it reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you know what that means? It means exactly what it says. If you absorb his ministry, his word, his doctrine, you don't have to be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Why? His name was Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 2, in my Father's house, are many mansions. Mansions here mean it's moni in the Greek, and it simply means a resting place. A lot of resting places. Have you ever really felt rested in Christ when you lean on Him? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's always with you. You may drift a distance from Him, but He will not depart from you. If it were not so, not maybe or perhaps, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's his promise. And just as sure as you feel it's good to be home, he has that home for you. He wants to come, he wants you to come home to him, and he wants to enter into you, whereby you, in a sense, then become a part of the house of God. House, dwelling place, moni, resting place, whereby you are able to attain peace of mind. Oh, it is real sad when a true Christian allows little problems of this world to upset them and to especially allow them to come into, I repeat, into their home. That's sad when you have so much to rejoice over. That is to say, you've got the victory. No one can conquer. There is not one evil spirit that can enter your house, your home, 
if you stand up and order in his name anything negative out. And of course, common sense prevails as far as man is concerned. You think ahead, prepare ahead, you're there. He didn't say maybe that he was going to prepare this for you. He guaranteed it. And do you know something? He sits, where did he go? To the claim the throne. He's sitting there at the right hand of God. And when you need help, he is your lawyer. That is to say, your intercessor, your advisor. He's there to help you with whatever help it is you need. When you are in him, it's axiomatic that you promise, you practice common sense. Anytime you drift away from common sense, you've departed reality and you're headed for trouble. I'm going to say that again. Anytime you depart from common sense, which is a part of God's word, you depart from reality and you're in trouble. So always bring yourself back to that rest and that peace. Don't be anxious. Fear is the unknown. If you're up in God's word, there shouldn't be too much unknown, and you should be anxious to make it known for in your particular case and as it applies to you, if that be the case. He says, I'm going to prepare a resting place. I hope you've already moved in, dear one, in your heart and your mind and your soul. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, and where I am... There ye may be also. Did that say when you die? Did that say in the eternity? No, it didn't say that at all. It says where I go, you can go too. Why? He's your advers He's your um, intercessor. He is the one that gives you the guarantee. He speaks for you. And you see, you are with him because you are in him and he is in you. You can go there, meaning you can attain that rest now. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not some promise in the sweet by and by. Now, you have that promise if, if you do it his way. Stick with reality, face reality head on, always take the hard ones first and the rest falls in line easy. That's my doctrine, you do it however you want to. Bring on the tough boys first. And when I knock them out of the way, the rest will run. All right? That's the way it goes. I'm talking about daily problems, all right? Not as an old combat marine. But I can do that too if I have to. Okay? But just, what do I mean by that? Translate into lay terms. Something you dread the worst in the day when you wake up in the morning. Take care of it first. Otherwise, you're going to begin dreading that. You're going to forget the promise that God made to you. And you're going to be dreading it so bad, you're going to mess up everything you go to do all day long. Take care of the hard stuff first. Get it out of the way. Get it behind you. Why? Because for God's champions, there is no hard stuff. There are no longer giants. We're the giants, spiritually speaking. Don't ever forget that. That was his promise to you. And don't ever doubt a promise of Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 4, And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. A lot of people, even some of the disciples, would say, Lord, where are you going? We don't know the way. Well, you do. Because you're after the fact. You can play Monday morning quarterback. Okay? In other words, you've got the letter. And you don't have to play guessing games. You know where he went. You know where he sits. He's there today. He's there for you. And I don't know, how often do you talk to him? Well, I got lots of troubles. How often do you talk to him? How often have you asked him for help? Well, he never helps me. Boy, I can understand why. I sure can. If that be your attitude. It is family. It's the same house. It's the same protection. He's your father, the nearest relative you have. I don't care who you are. He created your soul. 
And he sent that son that promised this house, our father's house. If he's your father, don't you belong in his house? If you're a Christian, I think so. I hope so. I know so. If you stick with the reality of the letter that he has written to you. So, in our Father's house, there are many resting places. Scratch the word mansions, and if you don't under, if you, if, you know, right away people say, oh, I, I'm going to be rich. Wrong, wrong attitude. You're rich, all right, but not in the way you see a big mansion up on the hill. That's carnal when you look at things that way. The word in Greek is meno, and it means resting place. Resting place and peace of mind is far more important than a place on the hill. If you have that peace of mind, you're wise enough that give you a couple of bricks and a hammer and some nails and two befores and you'll build a place on the hill. There's nothing to that. But you've got to have the right mindset in him. For if you know where he went, you should want to go also. Why? As he promised, he has returned to us. Well, are you talking about the second advent? No, I'm talking about the, the, um, the, um, when he, he was with, walked with them 40 days before he ascended back to heaven. And they were 10 days before the Holy Spirit returned, as, it's, as it is written in the Word. You know, there is another verse, and it may digress a little bit, be that as it may, but I want you that when you apply the deeper sense to this home, apply it knowing that that is naturally in, within us. When you have the knowledge of the first earth age, where were you this earth age? You want to go home? You have that desire to go home? Is that why home is so precious to you? Think about it. Think in depth. Those of you that just, just nail her right there, just remember, home is where we all long to be. And why, well, why are we here? We got work to do. God chose you because he can count on you. He knows you can, he knows that you can cut it. That's why he picked you. You earned it. So enjoy it. Enjoy the peace of mind that goes with it, though. Don't just accept the truth and be a bundle of nerves. That won't, that, hey, something wrong somewhere. You've got a short circuit, probably up here. You're not making contact with the peace that he has offered you just for the taking. He paid the price. You think about it. You know, we have work to do, but perhaps that gives us a little insight to that that is natural within us, knowing I want to go home. I want, I want to feel that peace. And someday we shall. Until then, we got work to do, and there are no short, shortcuts and there are no short circuits when you keep your mind in and upon him. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. Second book of Corinthians, let's pick it up with chapter, what do we want here, five. Second Corinthians, chapter five. Chapter five, and it reads, Second Corinthians, for we know that if our earthly house that, that's your body, your okaya, your house, of this tabernacle were dissolved. If it went back to dust, we have a building of God. Don't ever forget that. That's an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Sometimes it's kind of difficult. To, you can lose sight of that, forget about it, get sidetracked. Guess who sidetracks you? Satan. Why do you let him get away with it? Is he smarter than you? Don't let him sidetrack you. Well, I just can't help it. Yes, you can. Don't be a baby. 
stand up and act like a man, woman, or a child of God. All right? You have that house. It is yours. He paid for it. So don't be a packer. Don't hold back. When he calls upon you, walk in. Verse 2. For in this we groan. We, we have that inner feeling that just kind of sighs. Earnestly desiring to be clothed on, clothed up on, with our house which is from heaven. That, that's kind of an inner thing. I tell you, it's wonderful. It's precious. If it's yours, you know, it doesn't belong to everybody. Is it, did God cut them out? No, they cut themselves out. They just don't want, you know, I guess they're too busy with the earthly body to worry about the higher. There they go, down the drain, right down the tube, letting Satan just bat them here and there, upset them, get under their skin. Oh, why doesn't God bless me? Because you don't deserve it, that's why. Work for him, he'll take care of you. Don't work for him. Hey, if you enjoy being on your own, have to it. Okay, I'm saying that because many times we analyze other people, but we fail to analyze ourselves because we think we're something special. If you're not careful, do you know who that is the main, um, who that's the main MO of? Satan. Satan wants you to think you're special. Uh, that is better than your own peers. I mean, I mean, after all, God created you, right? You are something else. No, you're family. And with family, we're all the same. And we look out for each other. And we try our best to do it God's way. So when your inner being loans for that peace of mind, it's yours. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to reach out and grab for it. It's his promise. Just do it his way. Be about his business and you'll earn it. It'll be yours. Three. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. All, Paul is drawing on so much there. In other words, he's saying, make it to the eternity, all right. But don't show up there naked. You know, just, just, just wanting to make it, that doesn't really get it. Do you know where he's drawing from? I can't help it. I'm gonna, I'm, this is probably going to make me go over a little bit. He's drawing from, if I remember right, it's 318 of the great book of Revelation. And it's written there, the words of Christ. I counsel thee. This is my advice to you, Christ speaking. To buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. That means deeds that will withstand the test of fire. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. What is the eyesalve? This word, his truth. And letting it face you in the morning as a reality. That you're God's child. You're a member of his household. But what, what actually, and I'm not going to carry it on to chapter 19 of Revelations. What is it, verse 7 or 8? That your righteous acts here today weave the linen that you wear in heaven. Don't show up there naked. That's what Paul is saying. Verse 4. For we that are in this tabernacle, this flesh body, do groan. Oh, hey, hey, getting old ain't for sissies, friend. Just not, all right? But that's all right. Hey, being burdened, not being, bur being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that morality might be swallowed up of life. And, and certainly it is when you look forward to that eternal uh, life. And weaving that clothing. 
And you know, it's such a pleasure in weaving that clothing. You know what it is? It's helping others. It's sharing that that does, if anything, make you special is the charisma, the gift God gave to you to be used, not hid under a basket. Oh, I just hold it for myself. No, if you're so much, share it. Let that word of kindness come forth and make people feel good around you. That's what Christ wished of you, that they see you are a little salty when it comes to carrying the Spirit because it rubs off on others. I, I don't know, does that happen when you walk in a room? It, it kind of should, okay, a little bit. Of course, we all have different gifts, and, and I'm not try, I don't want anyone to get off on a guilt trip or anything like that, but it should a little bit. Be clothed. Now's your opportunity. You might think, well, I've had it rough in this world. We'll be rich in the one to come then. You can start preparing now, and it'll be a pleasure. A beautiful, beautiful thing. Verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God. It's your Father. Who ha also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Do you know what this, this word earnest is a legal term. What you would call it today, every time you buy a new appliance, you've got the same word written down below. It's guarantee. I guarantee the one on that appliance probably isn't worth the paper it's written on, unfortunately. But this one is. It is a guarantee of his word and his acts, and he'll stand behind it. Verse 6, therefore, we are always confident, you can be sure, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, in this flesh body, we are absent from the Lord. Okay, away from him, but, but he is in us and we are in him. But what he's saying is, you can count on it. When, you, when this flesh passes away, you're going to proceed on to the Father. What are you going to be wearing? Boy, I, you know, I put my best on to come to church sometimes. Well, I'd hope you'd want to go there well decked. Okay, you keep the gospel armor on and you will. You will be um, rested, protected, and taken care of. Verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, I got to see it. Well, tough for you. If you don't have faith, you don't have anything. Do you know that as it is written in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, it is impossible to please God without faith. Well, maybe that's why he's not answering my prayers. Could be. Could be. I'll say it again, impossible to please God. I hope I'm quoting that right. I'm sure I am. Maybe check me out. <coughs> Book of Hebrews, 11th chapter, I think it's the 6th verse, somewhere along in there. Impossible to please God without faith. So if you don't have faith, if I were you, I wouldn't even take a shot at it. Unless you've got some time to waste. It's much better. Well, how do I strengthen my faith? By being learned in his word to know examples such as Psalms 22, that it was written a thousand years before the crucifixion took place, and even the words that passed from the evil high priest's mouth are written there. Even down to the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing, written there a thousand years before. That should strengthen your faith, because yet man will say, well, I, I, I don't know if I can believe that or not. And you, you, they'll get their little newspaper in the morning and pick it up and they'll read that ink and they'll say, do tell, did you hear what happened to poor little Susie? She's a bad one. Is that Christian to judge somebody by what something is? It? Do you believe newspapers? I mean, you know, they try, but if, if you were a, an aircraft technician or pilot, and you were to read some of the reports the newspapers give on accidents, it is, the accident isn't funny, but they can never get it right. Never. 
And that goes with judgment many times. In other words, what is my analogy? Why is it that you can't believe God's word, but you believe what some man writes, his traditions? There's no comparison, dear one. His word is perfect. It always happens exactly as it's written. So walk in faith. Now, do you know something? God trusts you. He lets you be the captain of your house. I mean, you're it. You're, you're the gate of the mind that says what it's going to do and what it's not going to do. What it's going to allow in and what it's not going to allow in. He trusts you like that. He gives you that much credit. So having said that, um, let's go to the book of Ephesians. And verse 13, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, I'm sorry, dos, two, second chapter, sorry, ni, here we go, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye know, I'm sorry. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That, that made it possible, beloved, the blood of Christ. 14, for he is our peace. That's your resting place. Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Meaning, there's no exceptions. It's that way between all of us. 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, not the law itself. Don't get sucked in there. Ordinances. Blood ordinances. His blood took the place of one in all times. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The old and the new brought together. Verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. He made it possible. He opened the gate. You know, if we all had to make it on how good we are, we would be indeed in trouble because we mess up, all right? But he stands at that gate ready to forgive you when you fall short and, and gives you a big hug and says, come on in. You're home. Rest. Verse 17. And, come, and came and preached peace to you which were far afar uh, off and to them that were nigh. Far off means to the Gentiles and nigh Israel. He, gave, he made it available to both and tore the wall down there between Eight, as with salvation. It's there. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. There is only one spirit, God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, uh, certainly, that intercesses for you, intercedes for you. Verse 19, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Right? Welcome home. It's there for those that want to come in. And if they obey the rules of the house, okay, that's just the way it goes with our father. He's a disciplinarian. 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Is your house built on that? The apostles, the New Testament. 
You know, your spiritual home, if it is, well, I, I, I never quite had time to study it. You don't have a house, friend. Sorry. You're out of luck. Built upon the prophets, Old Testament. That's how you build this body. Well, I, I've never quite got around to that. Again, you got no house, friend. Well, I thought, all, I thought all you had to do was believe and be nakeder than a baby jaybird. Be somebody. Be somebody in him. You know, people, you know, these Christians that are 90-day wonders and like sunny-side-up eggs, they break easy. Without this word and a working knowledge of it, you can't be a comfort to anyone. Pat them on the back and hug them. That's about it. But as far as telling them how to fix it for sure and for good in their life, you're helpless. You can't help anyone. If your house, you can't help them build their house without it be built on both the New and the Old Testament. You're worthless as far as helping or doing God's work in a ministry. If you don't have a working knowledge of it. This has nothing to do with being a citizen or a child in God's house. I, I just, you know I'm a little hard on preachers I guess. I really am. Because, hey, I'm hard on myself. I truly am. And um, uh, that's just the way it is. If we don't align with this, we don't fit. And I'm going to tell you something. Someone that misleads children, they're murdering souls. Not flesh bodies. And if you think the penalty of a murder for flesh is severe, wait till God talks to you if you've brought the soul death of some innocent children when you set yourself up as a leader. Heavy stuff, friend. Real heavy stuff. I don't want to frighten anyone. Don't want to put anyone on a guilt trip. It's just um, the way it is. All right? Just the way it is. Because you must learn from both the old and the new for God. Listen to me carefully. God is the same yesterday. He is today. He's going to be the same tomorrow. That's why he's so easy to get along with. He doesn't change his orders of the plan of the day after the day started. It's the same. And he's easy to please if you will accept his plan. And bless your hearts, I'm trying to find my place. <laughs> I truly am here, I believe. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed, that means built right, together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Many membered body. In other words, you've got to understand God's truth before it can be fitly joined or you're going to have some bad joints. I mean, if you don't believe it, you try to fit, you try to fit somebody over here that's building a house across the field over there in with God's word and you'll see it's a bad joint. It just won't fit at all because it's not biblical. So what am I saying? That we that study his word are better than anyone else? No, but do study his word and make it fit God's word and you will have a, a house where Christ is the chief cornerstone for there are some houses that go by his name that wouldn't allow him in. They won't allow his word to be taught there chapter by chapter and verse by verse because it might offend someone if you bring up the controversial part. And our idea is just to get numbers, numbers, numbers. Do you know why? Because numbers have wallets. They're not too worried about God's word, okay? Now, I'm not going to digress into that, okay? That's just a knowing fact. That's it. Okay, it should be, it should look well, all right? And it should wear well if it's properly fitted. 22, 
Listen carefully. This is important. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Think about that. That's weighty, friend. You become a habitation for God. That's why you should be fitly jointed together. That's why you should have a working knowledge of the apostles and the prophets. You're the head of your house. What do you know about leading your home in God's work? Now, I'm, I'm not trying to shame anybody or put anybody down. because, But yet at the same time, as we teach, uh, this being the many-membered body, it goes out all over the world. And it's a fit question, you know. You see, what was the most important thing about that house? Did you overlook it? Well, what holds a house together? The cornerstone. You don't got that? I'm sorry. Your first wind comes along, your house is going to fall. Who was, who, who was that chief cornerstone? Christ. And that cornerstone can also become a stone of stumbling if you're not if you're ignorant of his word, biblically illiterate. So be careful, friend, in building and shaping and fitting yourself into his home as you have him in your heart. Is he hard? No, but he likes it when you listen to him. Don't you like it when your friends or children listen to you? You know, that's kind of the way he is. Now again, I want to say it. Now, turn on over with me as we go here to, to James, because there's another side to this that I think, great book of James. There is another side to this, for I want you to know that, as I stated, God wants you to be the captain of your house, your body. And for that reason, I think we could absorb this. Chapter 4, book of James, verse 3, let's read it. Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss, that you may, consu that you may consume it upon your lust. That means self-pleasure is what the Greek word means. Don't, don't ask. Ask for stuff to help you be a better Christian. <coughs> ask, ask the Father to help you, assist you in knowledge and wisdom, in things whereby you can further your own self. He'll give you that, and He knows what you have need of for your pleasure. He adds, that is to say, your comfort, maybe I'd better say. And, and He knows that. He says, I throw that in for free. I'll bet many of you think that's not scriptural. It is. It sure is. It's written. You think I'm going to tell you where it is? And not right now, because I can't remember. <laughs> oh, I, I'll tell you. I'll give you a clue. It has to do with worry warts. That is to say, by being worried, you can't add one uh, minute, moment to your life. You know, all worry does is destroys you. And that's in the scripture where he says, I know every bird that falls. And if you, think, if you think I can't clothe you, what do you think about the, the lilies that are better dressed or was it daisies? Whichever. I'm teasing. Better dressed than Solomon. And then he said, don't worry. When you do it my way and do my work, I know what else you have need of. That's very scriptural. All right. Digression, you bet. You ask and you don't receive. Why? Because you ask amiss. Four, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? You got, when the old world starts uh, being your friend in a heavy side way, you better wake up. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
that kind of keep him from answering prayers, wouldn't it? I think so. Five, do you think that the scripture saith in vain? You think God's wasting his time? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. I want you to underline the word um, uh, dwelleth. It is keotia. Did you catch K added to the word atia, atio, which is house? Okay, it means it's got it's made up of two Greek words, k k t. And that means down or now. In other words, he says, don't you realize that your flesh bodies sometimes desire things that are contrary to God? That's what that means. Well, I'll bet none of you knew that, that your bodies sometimes want things that don't line up with God's plan. Did you know that? Well, they do sometimes, okay? At least mine does. I'm going to be honest about it. If you listen to the flesh, it will getteth thee in much trouble, okay? So you don't, in other words, there's two of you. There's the spirit man that dwells with inside that is eternal if you earn it. And there's this flesh body that will talk you into anything it wants, starving to death, feed me, okay? And so forth, all right? Like you're sitting there now and it's saying, move just a little bit, I'm getting crushed, you know? Well, maybe. <laughs> Sorry I brought that up, but the nervous system does have a way of talking to us when we're uncomfortable, all right? Or comfortable, whatever. I'm moving on here. <laughs> the word dwelleth, which is my point, is the word house, with meaning your earthly house. It, if you listen to it, single it out, it will get you in trouble. Six, but he give us more grace Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now listen carefully. This is how you clean your house. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist, I say resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you think God was just wasting time when he said that? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why? You're the head. You're the captain of your house. And when you say no, Satan's going to run like a rabbit. Okay? When Satan comes to your house and wants to cause trouble between you and your mate, no, in Jesus' name. He's out of there. I mean, you're it. You're the captain. Don't let him come into your house and say, Honey, do you know what that old boy just did to you? What? Well, he has mistreated you. Look at him. He's reading the newspaper and watching television and here as pretty as you are. He's ignoring you totally. Yeah, he is, but he's watching television. He's interested. Pretty as you are, you ought to be paying attention to you. And then she says, I wish you'd turn that television off. I mean, don't. Hey, that comes for free, all right? <laughs> don't let Satan in your house. You're the captain. Say no and mean it. And do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Be considerate. When two are one flesh, they're one flesh. And what makes one half of the body uncomfortable makes the other half uncomfortable. What pleases one half of the body pleases the other. It should be, okay? I don't even know why I got into this, okay, this particular part, other than, you know, the flesh body can get you in trouble, but you can make the devil flee from your house, your body, I mean the whole thing, just by putting him on the road, but don't forget the word resist. Some people don't have much resistance, okay? All right, I think I'm going to leave that. Now, what can happen to your house in a bad way? Uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 12 to finish this. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 12. God really does trust you. I mean, he, he leaves it totally in your hands, but he has set forth examples of what can happen to your house. He'll let you do whatever you want to with it. I mean, you're free. Even the truth will set you free to do whatever you want to. But whether you're blessed or not depends upon that. Christ had just uh, cast a um, demon out of a young fellow or a man. And um, he left this example of your house. Okay? Meaning just the house we're talking about. I want to pick it up with verse 43. Listen carefully. Do not let this happen to your house. When the un this is Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, when you order that unclean spirit out in the name of Jesus, he's going to flee. Okay, you can count on it. He walketh through dry places. They don't like dry places. Seeking rest. He wants a nice, moist body. Okay. He wants to find rest. Where do you get rest? Home, house, and findeth none. 44. Then he saith, I will return into my house. That's the word I want. Okay. I'm going back. From whence I came out, and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. I'm telling you that little preacher came in here and he ordered that demon out and then he just took off. But boy, he got rid of the demon. But you see, the little preacher forgot to install Christ in the house. In your house. And naturally, when you help someone, if you don't, don't leave it empty. Put Christ inside it. And then the evil spirits can never come near. You know, some of you get in big trouble, don't you? I mean, right in your own family. Because you let Satan in and let him chew on the whole family. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You really should be ashamed of yourself if you let Satan in the same house with your little old kids. He'll take advantage of them. Put bad thoughts in their mind. Just cause all kinds of trouble. Don't leave your house empty. It's precious. Do you know something? It's the only place you can, really, one of the only places you can really get rest. And if your little old flesh body doesn't get rest, guess what happens to it? Hmm? If your little old flesh body doesn't get rest, pretty soon you get all nervous and you're, nervous system goes in and you know that begins to affect the tummy the tummy can't digest it the bladder the not the bladder the gallbladder that's what I'm trying to say that gets the wrong message and it turns loose just a whole gob of acid to digest food and there's none there so guess what it does to the tummy I mean pretty soon you're a nervous wreck why you left your house empty God sent all kinds of health laws along saying, this be your body. You put scavengers into it, your house, you're going to be sick. You're going to be sicker and sick. I put the scavengers down here to, to clean the earth and rid it of diseased dead animals. They're not fit to eat, so you leave them alone. That's biblical, all right? It truly is. So when you're taking care of your house, don't just take care of it part way. Apply the whole book as best you can, all right? It's not that difficult. I think when you start thinking about eating scavengers, that's pretty bad, you know? That's sickening. It's even sickening to think about it, much less partake of it. 
Somebody will go down here to the creek. You know what an old catfish will do? Goes down here and the catfish says, wow, a dead carp. <laughs> Boy, I mean, he got a dead possum. Got a drink and got in there. And I, just the old catfish just, I mean, lavishes on that dead possum. You know what the possum make? Well, and then they'll grab that. Boy, I got me a good in here. We'll fry this baby up and I'll feed it to my family. I don't know. I won't. <laughs> don't eat scavengers. I hope nobody needed this, okay, in this crowd anyway. They'll make you sick. That, and sure enough, they will, beloved, in all seriousness. Take care of your house. God tells you how. And he breaks it down. Do you know why he teaches in this way? So that we children can understand. He said, your body is like a house. So if there's something in your house that, well that doesn't smell good, you're going to notice it. So get it out. That, you know, it's just that simple, really. Now, do you know why Jesus said this? Well, did I finish that? Don't leave it empty. 45. Let's, let's finish this verse. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So, ask God's will and do it God's way. God directs if you allow him. He directs in part through his word. You know, I think sometimes that Jesus thought he had to repeat. Because in that same 12th chapter, back to verse 25, he'd, he'd, ca he'd cast out another demon, you know? And sometimes you have to repeat stuff to children, give them a chance, and that's what he's doing here. Okay, so you get the message of how to handle your house. Same chapter, same great book, Verse 25, and Jesus knew their thoughts. They said, he just cast them serpents, Satan, serpents and demons out in the name of Beelzebub. Okay. Beelzebub, which is the name for Satan, okay? He does that in Satan's name, not God's name. That's what they were thinking. Verse 25, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house, okia, akio, divided against itself shall not stand. Won't last, friend. Will not stand. 26. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? It can't. But he's got enough uh, nerve to keep trying until we do take him out. 27. If I, being Christ, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Well, they looked over at their kids and said, how do you all cast them out? And they said, we can't. We never have. Oh, I see what he's doing to us. <laughs> see, Christ had a way of kind of slipping up on people. He was one of the best lawyers you'd ever run across in your life. You see, that left him hanging way out over the edge. Verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, he's telling you here how to do it, beloved. Your house, take care of it. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. It's here. What did he say in the beginning when I said, I go, to, but I will return. I'm coming back to you as the comforter. He never left us. 29. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Do you know how to tear up Satan's house? Hmm? 
What did we learn earlier concerning um, Kate or Kia? This flesh body. Resist the devil and he'll what? He'll flee from you. Use the power of the name of Jesus Christ that he has placed within you. And you can bind Satan because Christ gave you power over all your enemies. Not part of them, not some of them, all of them. And that's what Christ is telling you here. If your house gets muddied up, clean it. But clean it in the name of God. And they will flee from you. Do you know why Jesus, when the, uh, when the evil spirits cried out to him, said, you've come to send us back before our time. Let us go into the hogs. Or swine, I think it's written. You know, and, and they did, you know. He let them go into the swine. And the swine, the lowest carnal flesh there is, drowned themselves. Why didn't Christ send them back where they came from? Because he gave you power to. He gave you power to bind Satan as far as your house is concerned. He's telling you here how to do a little house cleaning. Okay? And I, myself, I think it's great. What he's saying is, is there's no way Satan can come into your house and take your goods if you're strong enough to bind him and throw his house out. Okay, do it. Anytime something so negative that comes along and gets into your house and there's negative spirits, get rid of them and fill your house with joy and rejoicing in the power that God has seen fit to allow you to control your house. Okay, verse 30. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. That's simple. That's God's word concerning the house, the mansion, that place that it feels so good to be. After the long, tiring trip to say, thank goodness we're home. And just kick back and take a deep breath and relax and know that you are home. Let your body be a home that you can be restful in. How do you do that? With the gospel armor on and in place, you can defeat all your enemies. See to it. Take care of it. And thank him for the power and the trust that he has instilled within you and allowed you to possess that power to cause Satan, yes, Satan, to flee. He surely must love you. Return that love to him. Won't you let us pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the written word. Thank you, Father, for the house that is to be and the one that is now. Kea, Father, thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.